thought, okay, if I'm going to be doing this, I have to tie it in some way with what I'm doing. And I thought, I wonder if there are knitting songs. Who knows? And action. Hello, I'm Billy, and this is a vintage knitting podcast. If this is your first time here, let me just bring you up to speed. I often talk about my own personal knitting, but there are also occasions when I bring on other knitters and they come from all around the world. Today, I have a guest, she's from Canada. But before I bring her on, I just wanted to say thank you to all of the other people who have been here before. If you have not yet subscribed to this channel, please do so. And even though you have subscribed in the past, and check and see if you have the little notification bell on, because actually very few of you do. That's the best way to learn about when I'm coming out with a new episode. If you're enjoying this at some point during this episode, you can also give it a thumbs up. That helps. And I love to read your comments. I respond to every single one. So today, as I mentioned, I have a guest. Without further ado, let me go and grab her. I'll be right back. Okay, here I am. I am back with my guest. I think she pronounces her name Melanie Gall. Is that correct? That is correct. So okay. many people get it wrong. It's gall, like gallbladder. Phonetic, I don't know. Here we are. Um, I would not use this term lightly about anyone. And Melanie and I are meeting for the very first time, but I read a little bit about her and I've seen some of her videos online. I think that it's pretty fair to classify her as a Renaissance woman. And as we start to talk, you're going to find out why. So Melanie, let's start by my standard question. Where do you live? And what is something in your town that we would not find in a tour book? Well, I live between New York City and St. Albert, Alberta, which is a smaller, it's a city technically, um, just north of Edmonton, Alberta. So um, it is not, it's kind of a pass through town if you're driving to the Arctic which nobody does. <laughs> so, but I mean, the highway goes is like right up north. And um, honestly, I'm thinking what, what would not be in a tour book? Um, I think the amount of pickup trucks that people attach fake genitalia to the back <laughs> in this, there's, there's the first, everyone owns a pickup truck. I don't, everyone owns a pickup truck and everyone seems to feel that that pickup truck needs um, genitalia attached to the back. So now, That's how did thing. you end up in this remote place, especially well, having been in New York? Like, let's hear about that story. I grew, I grew up here. So, I mean, my, my dad was a professor at the University of Alberta, which is was like 40 minutes away. So this was sort of where you, this is the suburb to Edmonton. So um, he taught at the university. So we moved here and, and my mom's, this is my childhood bedroom from the pandemic. I, I came back to be with my mom from the pandemic and, um, because I couldn't get back to New York, the border was closed because I'm Canadian. So um, I am, yeah, basically I visiting here right now, I was just performing in another city and I'm here for a couple days and then I'm off to Scotland to sing. So, I mean, at this point, I guess, this is my home base. Um, unless oh. someone has an apartment in New York, they'd like to rent me. Um, because at this point, you know, after the, I mean, we're still in the pandemic, but sort of after oh, after the pandemic. I do. Um, do you? I do. Well, um, okay, well. We'll um, have to actually, talk about that private talk. on the um, key. Yeah, but it's been so busy sort of getting the performance career back on track um, that has taken every minute of every day, basically, because every, things did stop during the pandemic. You know, everything wait, stopped. So, wait, you're going um, too fast for me. Sorry. Because there's like so many facets fast. to you. So you just blew out that you're going to Shetland and you do performances and you've lived in New York. So like, let's slow down and break these things Ooh. down. First of all, I want to talk about Shetland because I'm hoping I'm trying to get there in September for Shetland Wool Week and already I see things are like booking up and whatever but where in Shetland are you going to be and how do you get there? Um, I'm actually Shetland. going to Edinburgh I wish it were Shetland I'm sorry it's not as it's not as much fun I'm going to oh. Edinburgh which is oh, further south Shetland. yeah um but I'm, I have a few days off at the end and I actually might go to Shetland I'm considering I have three days before I, I leave so I might try to get up there um yeah, I. The thing is, I'm. If you're thinking of going to Shetland, yes, things are booked up. But people are going to cancel. People, I mean, people always cancel at the last minute. So you might, mm -hmm. you might find, you might find something. But 
Yeah, I've always wanted to go to Shetland for, for Wool Week. Well, this might be the year. Go. Maybe so. Um, so performances, let's put aside for a moment, because I want to hear about New York. You have lived in New York. Why? Um, I went to college there. I did my postgrad. I actually, I, I guess I did my master's degree and then a post-master's a few years later in New York. So um, I moved there, honestly, when I moved there, I had never thought, wow, one day I want to live in New York. I had watched Superman and I don't know, all the movies of the eighties set in New York. And I'm like, that place looks like a crime ridden cesspool of it. I never want to go there. And then I went to college there and I'm like, oh my God, it's, it's for me. I mean, I grew up in this smaller place, which people are lovely, but it is a smaller town mentality of everyone has to get married and get a house and get their pickup truck. And that's their life. That's it. That's, that's what you do. And the fact that I could go to New York and, and people had different, amb people had ambitions similar to mine in whatever field. It could have been advertising, dancing. I mean, everyone was trying for something and it was just so amazing. And I guess that's why I need to get back because I, it is a very, instead of being that weird girl who doesn't want to, you know, have eight kids and, and be a soccer mom, which is fine, but that's just not what I wanted to do. It was like, I am like everyone else pushing to succeed. And I miss So that. I live in Manhattan. I don't know if you know that. I know I did not know that. I used to live in Manhattan. So where did you go to school in New York? Um, I did my master's in Brooklyn College, mostly because I couldn't afford the, the first grad school I got into. And then I did my post-masters at Manhattan School of Music. So up at 127th in Broadway. Okay, um, so not too, I'm sandwiched in between those two. Uh, and then I lived at 80, 89th in Columbus for a couple of years. And oh my God, I love, I love living up there. That's sort of my neighborhood. But um, yeah, I mean, and then I worked there for several years in music and here is now basically. And then I started touring overseas. So there was no point to maintain a full-time apartment in New York if I was traveling so much. And you and studied music. That's what your degree is in. It's an opera performance. I have five degrees in opera performance, which is why I don't sing opera anymore. It took me it took me five degrees to realize that maybe that wasn't where my passion lay. I had good. It was fun, though. I learned I learned a lot. I know a lot about opera. I know a lot about vocal pedagogy that I that I use. But also, um, I it, think it has to be very tough here being an opera singer because there's like the best in the world. And there's very few spots at the Met. And now there's no more City Opera. So I guess they're smaller companies. I, I don't know. But, you know, if you want to pick the place where you have the most competition and the best competition, it's here. So yes. I think that would be really hard. But OK, you have carved out a niche in another yes. area of singing. And just so that the knitting people watching this aren't uh, put off, the singing sometimes has to do with knitting. Often, so. <laughs> often has to do with knitting. Often, yes. Okay. Often. yes. So um, I think it was through Karen C.K. Ballard that mm -hmm. I heard of you. I'm hoping to be able to interview her on this show, but I had some correspondence with her and she said, oh, if you're interested in people who sing about knitting from original um, sheet music, you should contact Melanie Gall. So I did, and here we are. So oh. I, there's so, so, so much to talk about. I think it would take us, you know, many hours to get through it all, but we should move into this knitting thing. Yes, so into knitting. What brought you to singing about knitting of all things? All right. Well, I mean, this back in 2009, um, which actually is quite a long time ago. It doesn't feel like it. But back in 2009, um, podcasts were just starting to be a thing. And my sister really wanted to have a podcast. She she works in a in a government job in a pretty high profile government job, and she wanted and she's a knitter and she wants she's a like a knitter knitter and she wanted something creative to do. So she said, "Hey, let, let's do a podcast." And I was like, "I don't know what a podcast is. That sounds hard." And okay, I'll do one. So I mean, so so okay, I was like, "We can do a knitting podcast for you, and we'll do a travel podcast for me." And I didn't realize like a podcast meant several episodes. So the fine, I said I'd do a knitting podcast, and we started doing it. She forced me to knit, and um. <laughs> As you hadn't do. knit before? I mean, I could knit. I knit for a, a leg warmers once. 
they weren't good. Um, there was no pattern. I was like, look, I knew you like warmers. So no, I hadn't really knit. And mm -hmm. so I, you know, she started to, she was, she's a, a diplomat. She was posted to Uruguay or to Argentina and it was right by Uruguay. So she would go to the Malabrigo factory and just like fill up giant bags mm -hmm. of their yarn at cost, like garbage bags. And she would come back with garbage bags on the ferry full of yarn. So we had pretty good access to some amazing yarn. Um, and Manas del Uruguay also, we got it pretty much at cost. So, you know, we, we, I started, I started classily with good yarn. So we did this podcast and, um, I thought, okay, if I'm going to be doing this, I have to tie it in some way with what I'm doing. And I thought, I wonder if there are knitting songs, who knows? And at that point I was, I was, um, researching old songs of Irving Berlin. I mean, he wrote way more songs that people know about and his early music, um, was out of copyright. So I was like, we're going to look up the early music of Irving Berlin so I can, perform it, um, they are very litigious at the Irving Berlin Foundation. So I had to find something that that was in the public domain and I did. And then I thought, okay, since I'm doing this research, what about knitting songs? So I found so one. So what years are we talking about? 20, 2009, this is 2009. No, no, Irving Berlin's music, 1911, oh. 19... 1914 and 1915 is I think about when he started writing lyrics. Um, and then 1916, he started writing lyrics and music. I mean, it's been, it's been 10 years since I've done a show about him. My <laughs> dates might be off, but I know by 1916, he was writing these novelty songs and they're, they're great. Um, they're, so throw out the names of some of these songs. Um, if you don't want my peaches, you better stop shaking my tree. Not no, about the peaches. Knitting, knitting oh, the knitting songs. I thought you meant Irving Berlin. I was okay. Oh, um, did he not do knitting songs? He didn't, but then I found knitting songs that other people wrote. Okay. Since, so, um, but other people like Harry Von Tilzer, who is one of the biggest songwriters in America, he, he wrote knitting songs. And um, a lot, Glenn Miller wrote a knitting song later in the 40s. Knit one, Pearl two. That's the one. <laughs> so um, some of the knitting songs were like, and then she'd knit, knit, knit. More power to your knitting, Nell. Um, the knitting itch. Um, there are several just called knitting, like several just called knitting. Um, one of those was the basis for Canadian international copyright law, because although it is an American song, it was written in Canada and it became this huge hit in America and the Canadian people didn't get the royalties because there was no international music copyright law in Canada at that point. And so they changed the law because of this knitting song. So I think it was 1917 when this happened, maybe 1918. Um, so yeah, the, and no one remembers it. Very few of these songs were recorded at the time because they were tossed off basically to sell sheet music and then on to the next song. A few of them were. There's the old, um, really old recordings of these from World War One era, but most of them weren't. So they were, they sold sheet music and then they just disappeared. And how did you find the sheet music? Karen C.K. Ballard was a giant <laughs> help. But how I mean, did you find her? The internet. <laughs> Um, whatever was around before Google, I guess it was Yahoo. I don't know. Um, I just, I was looking up this music. I did, there are several university libraries or compilations of like things where things, historic things have been digitized that has digitized old sheet music, but it just, it's whatever they happen to have or whatever someone has happened to have donated. So some of them came from these old databases, the British museum in London, I actually got a grant to go to it because they, they, I could see they had the knitting songs but you couldn't access it online. They are really big on copyright. Even if the songs are no longer technically under copyright, they, they just, they weren't listening. So I got a grant to go to London, showed up there and they wouldn't let me in because you need two pieces of unexpired photo ID and my passport wasn't good enough. And my driver's license, had just expired. So they wouldn't let me in. I was like, here's my credit card. Here's like my American visa, none of it, none of it. So um, I wasn't allowed to go. So I, a knitter actually sent, she went, she went for me later. I should have just done that in the first place. And mm -hmm. she got me the music. Um, yeah, and then I discovered Karen and she was incredibly generous with her knowledge and with her music. And she's lovely. I've never actually met her in person after all these years. It would be nice. It would have been fun to have both of you at the same yes. time and had a three-way conversation, but okay, it didn't work out like that. Um, so already we know that you've traveled extensively, you perform, you sing, um, 
you research sometimes <laughs> you have yes. written a book let's uh, talk yes about, it's, yes let's talk about Deanna Durbin in the book okay well I mean I happened to here's the I just got I do I mean it's I just got my author's copies like two it's days just ago. right here I'm like it's right here it's my book so um Deanna Durbin the 1930s film star who was a knitter if we can connect this um at least during World War II she knit and she used to tell people that it took her so she was so busy on set making films that she actually took her three months to finish a sweater and which sounds reasonable to me however um because that's how long it would take me to finish a sweater but that was considered a long time during the war you're just supposed to you know just toss off that sweater in a few weeks um and she she said that she could recall the movies she was working on by looking at pictures of the things she had knit because so she really did connect her knitting to each movie but no, this is a biography of Deanna Durbin. No one has ever written one. Um, she is, was it's the most famous movie imagine. star. I, she wouldn't allow it during her lifetime. She didn't want to be in the spotlight. And then, so she died in 2013. And anyone who would have been around to do it at that point was was dead. I mean, you know, anyone who who would, all the research was gone. So it was, it, here we are. Did you have an opportunity to interview her? No, I didn't. Um, and she wouldn't have she wouldn't have spoken to people anyway. She was very private. I did a lot of research and I spoke to people who had spoken to her um, in her later life. I'm not right before she died, but I guess in the decade before she she started up correspondence again with several of her fans who had written her in the 30s and written her in the 40s. And then fast forward to like the 1990s and early 2000s. Some of them had regular correspondence with her and she she maintained that. So why Deanna Durbin? Only because nothing had been written about her previously or because you have some affinity to her? I perform in Winnipeg, Canada a lot. I mean, a lot. I, every year I just, I just got back from Winnipeg. There's a big theater festival there and um, I bring a different show there every year. And Deanna's from Winnipeg. So I thought, okay, I mean, I knew about her because if you're performing in Winnipeg and you sing, people are gonna say, when are you doing a Deanna Durbin show? And I was like, I don't know. So after about a, almost a decade of, of singing there, I thought, you know what, whoever this Deanna Durbin is, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to research her and do a show. And then I started doing the research and she's, it was fascinating. I cannot believe, I guess, how involved she was, not only in the history of Hollywood, but, but some of the biggest names in Hollywood wouldn't have had careers, might have gotten killed in Nazi Germany, like they might not have, they might not have gotten out. Um, Universal Studios would be closed. There would have been would be no Universal. All the movies they made wouldn't have existed, and all because of her. And it's amazing. It just her history is fascinating, and she knits. There are some other movie stars who we've heard similar things about, like Josephine Baker. I think was I don't know a secret agent. Um, yep, she worked for the French Resistance. Right. And Hedy Lamar also made some unbelievable discovery. I mean, two really extraordinary women. So I didn't know that about Deanna Durbin. Oh, I might have to read the book. So nobody knows. I am going to put links below in the show notes. There'll be a link to where you can purchase the book, of course, and to your website, which has links to little snippets of some of the songs that you sing and a lot more information about you. Um, do you also act? I mean, I, do, I write these shows and I act in the shows. I mean, I'm, I'm a trained singer. The acting is just, I mean, I, yes, I suppose. Yes, I do act. Um, I, I don't get, I mean, I don't consider myself an actor exactly because I don't go and audition for, for shows as an actor. I just, I write shows and I sell those shows to theaters and then I'm usually in those shows that I sell to, it's sort of like Noel Coward early in his career, you know, he just, he would write plays with parts for himself. And that's how he became a star. Um, so, I mean, I do that. It's just usually mostly only me. <laughs> um, sometimes there, there are other people in the show and I do sell the show and I'm not always the one in it. I mean, most, but mostly I am. I sort of, instead of auditioning and waiting for people to want me, um, I basically sell them me from the start. It's, it's a different way of going about performing. Now, how many different countries have you performed these shows in? Probably about, I, I used to have a list, um, probably about 48, 49 at this point. A lot. Not bad. A lot of countries. Um, there's, well, there was a lot, it was a bit crazy right before the pandemic because it was, you know, 
15 or 20 different countries a year. And then it all stopped. So how many days before the pandemic, how many days of the year would you say that you were on the road performing? Like 300 maybe. Wow. Probably like a lot of, a lot of days. Cause like, for example, I mean, at one point I flew from Brunei Dar Salaam, which is beside Malaysia. And I flew from there to Sudan, which is in Africa. I mean, the, that travel alone took like three days. So some of it, a lot of it's travel. Um, you know, flying to Australia is a good two days of travel. Mm. And I had to go from Australia to Japan, you know, so there, there's a lot of, a lot of travel. I have short legs, so it's okay. No, who does, who does all this coordinating for you? Are you doing it yourself or do you have an agent? Do you have like travel people who are telling you like, the, this is the best sequence of places to go to, to get the shortest route? I do it. I do everything. Um, do no, in the UK, in the UK, I have an agent in the UK. When I do gigs in, for the most part, when I do gigs in England, she arranges everything and I, I walk in and do the gig basically. So, I mean, that, that is wonderful. It is easy. She's amazing. Like she's wonderful. Um, a lot of the other gigs, you know, I'll, I'll get, say I get a gig in, I don't know, uh, Taiwan. So I'm singing a concert in Taiwan. Um, other ones that have been possibilities, I'll let them know that I sort of have something for sure in Taiwan and I can be in Abu Dhabi two days later and it won't cost them as much because I'm already partway there. Maybe Taiwan is not partway there, but like partway there. And so, um, yeah, a lot of what I do is admin. Like I, this morning I was up at six emailing bookers in Scotland to ask to tell them to come to my show. Basically, um, I emailed 200 bookers personal emails this morning. So, I mean, that that's not fun. I mean, as you're just sitting there like, oh, and I have a pet bird and she's like, she's just sitting there watching me like, wow, your life is boring. I'm like, thanks bird. So, I mean, so some, a lot of it, a lot of it is just slogging through admin. It would be great to not, and it's unpaid, right? Like you're just, you're just doing it because you have to, but it's okay. It's all part, it's all part of the thing. Um, right. It's people, either that or pay somebody else to do it for you. Yes. But you never know. I, I know people who do, and then they complain that it's not done right, or you know, so there's a typo mm -hmm. in every email, and it's just I I feel like to to do this right at this point, I need to be on top of things. And people like the personal touch, you know, they can email me, and I I'll answer immediately usually. So. So what will bring you back to New York? The first the first chance I have to get on a plane. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I was, I, um, I'm working on a CD right now in Brooklyn, like at my, I have a recording studio in Brooklyn and I, I started recording the CD in the spring and I just ran out, I ran out of time. I was singing in Orlando. I had to go. So, you know, I recorded the first few songs. So I, I am hoping to get back in, in late September, early October, you know, to live there. Um, who knows though? I have to do book promotion and New York Sheep and Wool is third week in October. You know, can't miss Rhinebeck. So I, I hope that we'll meet in person. Because, hopefully. Yeah, after I come back from Shetland, hopefully that's going to happen. Ooh, so then funny. I've never been to Rhinebeck because I got on this knitting train a little bit late. It's really like the third time in my life that I'm a serious, somewhat serious knitter. The first was at age four when I knit a huge bag of little squares that I thought I was gonna assemble into an Afghan. And then the second time was in my twenties when I left my corporate job. And then the third time was after my child was grown up and I could retire and have time to knit. So that's nice. just been like the last uh, four years or so, but- You need to go to Rhinebeck. Like <laughs> you just, you need to go. I mean, well, the, best you know, the pandemic kind of got that. in the way. But it just adds to the anticipation of Rhinebeck. Yes, I hope that I'll be able to go this year. That would be really great to do two big wool festivals. I don't know where I would put all the wool that I'm going to buy because my apartment um, is the size of a postage stamp. It just squishes down, I suppose. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, got, I love Rhinebeck. I love Rhinebeck. It is not my favorite knitting festival, but it is it is up there it is a great knitting festival. what's your favorite the leeds um what is it called the armley mills knitting festival in in leeds basically it's a small little festival it's in it was a couple weeks ago in june it is not attended by people who aren't local but like you should seriously you should go, everyone should go you should go to this festival i bought this shawl there i mean there are knitters who sell beautiful 
beautiful. I think this costs like $20. I mean, why knit if you can just buy a gorgeous shawl? But um, do they have all this? It's fun. I mean, that's why. Right. But you also knit. So, I mean, there's, there's all these local yarn producers. There's the local, the local, um, I forget what they're called. Um, Darling Roses, I think. It's like a woman's group that have been around for, for decades. They make all these cakes and you just sit around eating cake and buying yarn. And it's just, it's delightful. <laughs> and it's in an old mill. So, I mean, this is where, this is where fabric made of yarn was produced. So you're in this historic place and it's still set up as a mill. So you're in this old mill and there's like yarn booths around the machines and everyone's eating jammy cake. And it's just delightful. Don't tell this to my husband because I'm sure to, not to put down Warwick. I just think he, unless he finds a golf course that he can live on for the week, I don't know that he's going to enjoy being there as much as he would enjoy being in Italy. But you have Rhinebeck. You can go to Rhinebeck. Yeah, that he doesn't need to go to because it's local and I can go exactly. in a couple of days and be back. Yeah, but if yeah. I'm going to Scotland, I can't leave him behind. And he's like, well, what am I going to do while you're in these classes? I'm like, I don't know. Maybe you'll come to the classes. Maybe right? you'll learn to knit. Right? <laughs> Just like all the fishermen up there. Exactly. He should learn to knit. Have you seen men knitting in Scotland? Lots of Oh, them? yes. Oh, no. They've been amended in Scotland. Historically, they have, and they still do. Well, I know historically, but I didn't know, like, if that was a contemporary thing. Okay. Um, I mean, it's not as wide. It's not super widespread, but yeah. No, there. I have a friend who owns a knitting store in Edinburgh, and she has a lot of male customers. It's it's an adorable knitting store. I just, half the fun is going around and seeing these cute little shops and supporting I, the small businesses. Yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully we'll, we'll get there and hopefully he'll enjoy it. And hopefully I'll enjoy it. I think I missed anything big, important. Um, I don't crochet. I like to, my mom is a crocheter. My mom crochets like these amazing things and I need, I feel like that is something that I do at some point need to do, but, um, not yet. Well, if you want to crochet a 1950s blouse, I have a, a lovely pattern and I hope to do a crochet along with a small group of people, but I need somebody who's really expert in using crochet thread, not yarn, mm -hmm. and a very tiny hook because it's a very, very intricate, beautiful blouse. So stay tuned i'm still looking for an expert crocheter that sounds maybe not like the best first project ever to do i was no, thinking like a true. granny square but still you yeah know, that's like, true. also though also, i mean that would it would look gorgeous and to have something vintagey that you've crocheted would be beautiful instead of granny squares yeah like i'm not into the granny square thing i did crochet a blanket an afghan as a teenager and i've shown that on the show um, it's not granny squares, they're hexagons. So that was right. kind of like a, you know, fun. And they're, they're pretty, they're not flat. They have like ruffles, oh, that's, but that's, that's the only thing I've ever crocheted. I never had the desire to crochet anything else until I saw this blouse. I mean, my desire to crochet involves making cute little birds. Like, to be honest, it's more of a, a little birds thing, which I guess you could knit also, but I think, I think that's more of a crocheting thing to make a cute little Birds. I think you can knit birds. I've looked at some patterns because I have a sweater that has birds going around it that I knit and I thought it would be fun to have some kind of a hat that had a bird oh. sitting on top of it. So yeah, I mean there's a lot of things that uh, one can dream of doing. Yes, absolutely. So what, what have I missed? I covered the book, I covered singing, performances, traveling, little new york stuff um canada i don't know anything else i should know about you oh i i mean i have a pet sparrow that's weird but i guess it's not yeah. a knitting thing um why do you have a sparrow um because well okay well she's in the other room i can hear her screaming at the window as you do mm -hmm. she's used to being with me so i i you know she's been sequestered to her cage while i do this um, I was living in the Upper West Side of New York and they have the Wild Bird Fund, which is the New York's only wild bird rescue. And um, they have, they get a, hundreds of baby sparrows in every year. This was seven years ago. And my sister and I were living a couple blocks away and we're like, look at all those birds in the window. Let's go in and see. So we went in and we came out with the bird who needed a foster family and 
seven years later um she didn't learn to fly for quite a long time and she imprinted so she is my now she's up here in canada um so she's my little new york sparrow and, and this place weird. this is a physical place that people yes. go to it still yeah, it's still exists yeah it's it's at columbus in between 86 and 87 no 87th and 88th on columbus it is they get featured in the times like all the time because they whenever anyone finds a hurt bird in new york that they'll take it and they it's a huge i actually am my second book is actually about the history of house sparrows and i'm collaborating with them on this um because but yeah no i mean they they save the birds of new york it, i'll they put have, a link i'll look for it and i'll put a yeah. link in case there's anybody watching who wants to adopt a bird love i mean yeah i mean theoretically you're not supposed to adopt them you're not supposed to keep them you're supposed to fix them and they but she didn't she, she wasn't going anywhere. She decided she liked to live in in a, in a house more so than fix them and then release them back into the wild. Yep, yeah, because yeah, it's right by Central Park. So they release them or I mean, whenever basically whenever anyone finds a bird in trouble in New York, that that's where the bird ends up. So it's a again, it's this fantastic little piece of New York that tourists don't know about. I guess that would be my New York thing that's not in a tour book is that when you know when there's no pandemic you can go in and visit their seagulls and their swans and their ducks and you can see they have fancy pigeons in their window and it's just a very quirky neat part of new york city wow it sounds like the shop in paris well not exactly that has taxidermy all kinds of exotic birds um these birds are not dead but yes no, otherwise exactly the no, same. But like on the exotic scale, like yes. unusual, unexpected kind of thing. I'm trying to think of the name of that place. It'll come to me. It begins with a D. Anyway. And like what I find so amazing is like New York can be a cold city sometimes. Everyone's doing their thing. You know, it's everyone's busy. Everyone's, you know, more for more or less concentrating on what they have to do because it that's what it takes to live in New York. And so the fact that if someone sees a tiny bird in trouble, they will pick that bird up and like put the bird in an Uber or take them to a different borough to get them the help they need. It has brought New Yorkers together and just, it's just sort of, a, it just shows how caring people are in New York, you know, that they're oh, we get a bad it. rap. It's I so, know. You know, it's so not true. It's not, not true. fair. All the time I see people pouring over their cell phones, trying to figure out where am I and where's the closest subway. And I just always stop and help people. And they're like, oh, New Yorkers are so nice. We had no idea. People don't know until they're here on the ground that we are very outgoing. We're very resourceful mm -hmm. and we know our neighborhood. Like yes. I can't say that I know Williamsburg, but if you ask me something about Gramercy Park, I I know, like I know where the local cleaner is. I know where the closest movie theater is. I know where yeah. the live theaters are, et cetera, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. and I think we're helpful. I think we we want to help. I think I and do, except when, except when I'm in Times Square. Then I'm just like, no, I'm just gotta get out of here. No, Times Square's not New York. Like, Times Square's like New York. tourist town. Like no exactly, New York. except for there when you're just like out of the way, guys. <laughs> like I gotta go. Except no, but remember September 11th, how every New Yorker was there for every other New Yorker in That's the biggest true. way. And it, it was a surprise to people. They didn't realize that we're capable of that, but we are. Yeah, absolutely. So when you come back to New York, I definitely want to meet you in person and it. get to it. know yeah, it and it. get to know you better because you seem like quite an amazing person. Aw, that's really sweet. Um, well, how many people do you know who sing and write books and travel the world? And I mean, most of them have a social life. I have a lot of time. To do, I mean, realistically, everyone, I mean, you know, um, I just work a lot. Um, yes, you must manage your time very, very well because you've gotten a lot done. You're young and you've accomplished a lot. Well, well relative to me. You're young. I mean, I, I guess I have, honestly, it just feels like you're yes. doing, I just, it just feel like I owe my ambition this, like, I just, I've always wanted to have a book published. I've always wanted to tour the world singing. Like it just, I, I tried so hard. I'm like, you know, it's good. It, 
it's good that it's all coming together but also like i have put i'm not that young i have put a lot of work into this i mean other people have families and they go out on the weekend and have fun and watch netflix a lot and you know everyone's like have you watched this show and i'm like who has, who has time to watch a show i mean so i i work a lot i work hard but yes it is lovely the things are finally in the last few years except for the pandemic so take the that time out but leading up to that and then now things are finally sort of like okay things are working out pretty well hey well all the best to you kudos Thank you. Um, you can see I'm a fan. Aww. So, <laughs> well, because I've heard some of your singing and it's the songs are just adorable. And I hope everyone is grateful that you have unearthed these archaeological finds to bring them to us knitters. I think it's it's really fun. Is there one special place where people should go look for the knitting songs? I mean, they're they're on spotify i mean or on, they're on my web page but they are they're everywhere i mean they're widely released they're on spotify they're on itunes they i have they're two knitting albums the first is knitting all the day and the second is sweeter in a sweater so i mean they're i mean they've been out for about 10 12 years now so the, like they're around they're certainly around plus i have it took so me so people. long how did i not find you i don't know because you, everyone's busy knitting <laughs> that's why well okay but, thank you so much for being here and sharing your stories with us. Oh, thank you. Happy knitting, happy traveling. And you good too. luck. Lots of luck with your book. See you at Rhinebeck. <laughs> yeah. I hope so. I hope so too. All right. Ciao.